In the summer, I love herping, going to find reptiles and amphibians native to my area, but right now, where I live, looks like this. So, today, let's go over what reptiles and amphibians do to survive the harsh winter. My name's Adam, this is Diamond, you're watching Wiccan's Wicked Reptiles, stick around. So to illustrate how reptiles survive winter, I want to go over three main examples, and let's start off with snakes. Now there are exceptions, but I'm just going to go over things like garter snakes, fox snakes, uh, milk snakes, something like an eastern milk snake, because that's what I find here in southern Ontario, which is a part of Canada, and is very similar type species, colubrids let's say, throughout most of North America. Now. These guys, garter snakes especially, well, they go into hi hibernaculums, which are actually called hibernacula. A hibernaculum is a hibernacula if there are several of them. Anyway, basically these are very deep holes below the frost line that could be man-made, something like an old house foundation, or it could be something like a burrow from a rodent from years gone by, or made by a snake themselves. Basically, a snake is going to find one of these that is going to be below the frost line, which I said before, but it's important, because this is where it's not going to freeze. If an animal like a snake, which is an ectotherm, which means they don't produce their own body heat, they get their body heat from the air and the sun around them, they will just die if it's below freezing for too long and their cells start to basically freeze and then they will blow up. When water freezes, it expands and anyway, that's a terrible visual. So they'll find this safe space for the winter and they will brumate, not hibernate, that's different. Hibernation basically is like what a bear does. It sleeps for most of the winter in a cave or burrow, whatever. Brumation is different. Brumation, they don't go fully to sleep. Sure, they will sleep for extended periods of time. They'll be very slow. They're not gonna be very active, but snakes don't go to sleep for like six months, basically. They can sometimes get up and find water. Sometimes if it's warmer, they'll even go find food occasionally. This is a little bit more rare, but they're not hibernating. Brumation is definitely very different. And in this time, their body slows down, so they don't need as much nutrition. They're gonna rely on stores in their body mostly. And we know that snakes can go long periods of time without eating. This is a time where they slow their body down to a point where they hopefully don't lose a ton of weight until they can eventually emerge from these holes in the spring. But what's really interesting, in places like Manitoba, we actually have a national park dedicated to these basically giant hibernaculums, where we're gonna find literally hundreds or sometimes thousands of individuals in the same hibernaculum. So sometimes a snake will go by itself into a hole, but a lot of the times it's gonna be several of them and sometimes several different species. So you might find garter snakes and fox snakes and Eastern milk snakes all together in the same hibernaculum, which is insane, that's crazy. And then in the spring, they're gonna notice the temperature change, they'll come out, and then garter snakes is the best example. They create these breeding balls and they start warming each other up. There's a whole thing on the Discovery Channel that you can watch and David Attenborough does a better job of narrating everything than me, so for more information, go watch that. This is probably the most simple thing and let's just move on to something a little bit more complicated, turtles. Turtles sort of hibernate, but not really. And this is what I mean. A lot of people think that turtles just bury themselves in the mud under a frozen pond for six months and then they get up. Like, that's not really how it works. They can bury themselves in the mud under a frozen pond and they are going to slow their body down to the point where they need very little oxygen, very little but they can't be in the mud because then they can't get the oxygen. So they will lay mostly dormant on inside the mud or on top of the mud underneath a frozen pond or a river, and they're gonna use their natural stores of energy, glucose mostly, in order to feed themselves. But the oxygen thing we're gonna get to in a moment, and everyone likes to talk about butt breathing, but just give me a second before we get there. Sometimes snapping turtles and painted turtles, I'm using these as examples because I find these all the time around me, will actually be wandering around under the ice. Sometimes you'll go, like I go and fly my drone at this place here that you can see, and I will, I've actually seen snapping turtles under the ice moving. And although they do sit under the ice on top of the mud or in the mud for months at a time sometimes, basically almost shut down, 
they can still feel subtle differences in temperature. They can start to see light sometimes if there's a thaw. But the problem is if they're using their stores, especially glucose, in order to survive, right, on the limited amount that they need, they're gonna build a waste product called lactic acid. Basically, if you go to the gym and you feel like soreness in your muscles or you feel a cramp, that's lactic acid. It is a, a buildup of a waste product that they need to get rid of. In things like snapping turtles, because their shells are made of these uh, carbonates and calcium, it can actually neutralize this waste product. So it almost balances their biology just from their shell. So not only to protect them from predators, but to protect them from their own buildup of waste. And this is why you don't find soft shell turtles in stagnant bodies of water in the winter, mostly, because they don't have the ability to do this as well as something like a snapping turtle, which has a very big, robust shell. Snapping turtles and painted turtles oftentimes are kind of the kings of doing this. Okay, butt breathing. I know that this is what you came to this video to learn about. Butt breathing or cloacal respiration is basically when turtles breathe through their butts. Okay, how is that possible? Cold water is usually oxygen rich. For most of the year, obviously everything under the surface of the water is sucking in that oxygen as well. Other turtles and amphibians and things like that. So what they do is they have these vessels all over their body, but especially on their butts. And they can actually take oxygen from the water that is moving over their cells, over their skin, into these vessels, basically, and breathe that way. A very little amount of oxygen they can take this way, but that's all they need to survive the winter. If this goes on too long, well, then they die. But in the spring, it is almost like a mad dash. When they have the ability to get out, they're basically like a walking muscle cramp. They are so full of lactic acid. They've it neutralized as much as they can through their own biology. But in the spring, you're gonna get up onto these one of these logs or get up on a rock and try to warm up as much as possible and start respirating normally to get rid of this lactic acid and other waste products as well. This is the smartest I've ever, or dumbest, depending on how you look at it, I've ever sounded in a video. Do you want more scientific based videos like this? Let me know in the comment section below, hit a thumbs up and maybe we'll do more like this. But before we end the video, what about amphibians? What about things like frogs and toads? Well, frogs, this is kind of the most interesting one besides turtles, I think. When I was a kid, I was taught that frogs bury themselves in the mud and then they stay there for the entire winter and then they're good. But this is not the case because they breathe through their skin. So they can't breathe through their skin if they're coated in mud. The mud just doesn't have enough oxygen to let them survive. So instead, they're gonna nestle themselves amongst like rocks and logs and things like that just to be away, as much away as they possibly can from any sort of predation, which would be very rare anyway in such a cold environment, being that the water temperature will be like four degrees Celsius or maybe even lower, depending on the depth and depending if it's a river or a stream or a pond. So basically they're just breathing through their skin amongst rocks and logs and things like that. And when I'm saying frogs here, I'm talking about mostly aquatic frogs or semi-aquatic frogs. Terrestrial frogs and arboreal frogs are a different story. Wood frogs and spring peepers and chorus frogs and gray tree frogs and things like that that I would find here in the summer, they can't do this. They're not aquatic frogs. So instead, they have a very cool mechanism, which I learned about when I was a kid and finally just remembered when I was filming this video and doing the research, they freeze themselves solid with a little bit of antifreeze. And this is what I mean. These guys are not adapt. They're not good enough at burrowing deep into substrate, deep, like almost two feet down into the soil, like some other amphibians do in order to get away from frost, from freezing. So instead they go as deep into the leaf litter or into like a rock crevice or a log as they possibly can. And then it is going to freeze. So their body produces this type of antifreeze basically, which is just glucose, which is sugar by the way. And that is going to prevent most of their body from crystallizing. So their lungs will shut down, their heart will shut down. It's basically like they're the living dead. And then as spring starts to spring, as spring starts to happen, they will warm up and then the function will return to their lungs and to their heart. This is like a science fiction movie, but it's the truth. And I see these frogs all the time in the summer. Go on. Live your life. And I never see them in the winter, so that's how that works. And toads, because I love toads and I've got a couple spade foot toads of, of my own. Here in Ontario, we've got tons of toad species and they 
It's kind of boring, they just dig, basically. These guys, their feet are kind of made for digging, so they'll dig sometimes 50 centimeters, which is almost like two feet, basically, into the soil or the substrate that they have, so that when it does freeze, it, they're not gonna be below zero for long enough for enough of their cells to crystallize and basically they die. So it's like not as cool as the other two things we talked about. So there you go, I did my absolute best to be as scientifically accurate and explain these things as best as I could. What do you think? Do you wanna see more videos like this where I tackle these, how does this survive this? Let me know in the comment section below. Hit the subscribe, hit the thumbs up. This was a subscribe and a thumbs up. Hit the thumbs up and subscribe, I really appreciate it. And of course, a special thank you to the Patreon supporters. Thank you guys so much. It was one of you who gave me the idea to do this video. If you wanna get videos, days early if you want to get discounts on the merch if you want extra stuff to know about things in my collection including my dream reptile which i finally have that's on patreon as little as a dollar a month you can support wwr that way too and uh, i think i've told you to subscribe and hit like and stuff so uh see you on thursday